Rusan army rising. The church is the breeding grounds for raising godly men and women who are willing to apply kingdom principles and values to bring transformation to their respective societies. We need to have a national focus. We don't have to lose this ambition or else we work against the Great Commission. They are equipped in righteousness. Unless our righteousness exceeds those who just know ABC and surprise others to do, but they don't do. Unless we see that. We pray for God to raise right ministers in our nations. We pray for God to raise right tax collectors. We pray for God to raise right security agents. They are bold and fearless. Standing your ground when the battle has been heated to such an extent that everyone is running away. But we don't quit. For we know no defeat. The agenda to possess the nations. Welcome to an equipping center of the word and prayer on Pentecost hour. Stay tuned in. in Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Beloved, as you are aware, this year we're talking about building a glorious church so that we can really possess the nation. And what we are doing is do some introspection by way of touching some areas that we each most with regards to morals, character, virtues, and all that. My assignment for this year is to engage the church on this theme or topic, living a life of integrity as a Christian living a life of integrity as a Christian. Under the first part, we try to discuss the dire need of Christians of integrity and the dynamics of corruption in the society. We realize that even though in the Old Testament or in the Bible days, people were corrupt, but some people were able to stand tall like Noah, Job, Daniel, Paul, and the like. So in our time, we want to encourage ourselves so that we can be counted among the people who are righteous, blameless, upright, trustworthy, people who are not corrupt, people who are not covetous, and all that. And we try to speak into the issues that are happening in our society with regards to corruption. And I said that corruption, in this sense, has to do with the wickedness and the depravity of humanity, not just taking or receiving or t giving bribes. And I attempted to bring to the fore the corruption perception index in our country or in Africa. And we discussed that the 2019 corruption perception index, which was released just this year, around January 23rd, indicated that Two-thirds, two-thirds of the countries that were surveyed or analyzed scored below 50. And unfortunately, majority of the countries in the sub-Saharan Africa are not doing well. And there is little to no improvement with regards to tackling corruption. But when you look at all this and you come to think of the fact that we have churches in these nations, quite a lot of them. And Pentecost pride ourselves to be one of the fastest growing churches in Africa. And when we come to Ghana, we say we're almost about 10% of the population in Ghana. Then it behoves the church to start thinking twice about our message. And I've said and challenged ministers that we have the pulpit. Now everybody is listening to me. So we have made you who you are outside. It's what we tell you here that shapes your life outside. Last year, Ghana was competing with Burkina Faso at the position 78 with 41 points out of 100, 2018. That's sad to note that in 2019, we slipped from 78 to 80th position. And Burkina dropped further to 85th position. 
We talked about our friends, Nigeria. They slid from 144 to 146 out of 180 nations. And as chairman has said, if churches were to develop nations, then Nigeria would be first, Ghana would be second. But I've come to realize that it is righteousness that is us a nation. So corruption, as I said, has to do with the way we conduct ourselves outside, the way we work as Christians. So we ran through up to the second segment where we're looking at how the Old Testament and the New Testament perceived corruption and how God spoke about these things. So the second segment, we, we measured on bribery and extortion, which are in the Bible. We could talk about people taking bribes so that people could be killed, even our own friend Judas selling Jesus, Delilah taking money from his kinsmen so that he could sell his your bosom friend or husband. And we define bribe as money, favor, or other considerations given in exchange for one's influence against what is true, right, and just. I want to take it again. And then let's use the scripture as a scanner to assess ourselves how we are faring. A bribe is money, favor, or other considerations given in exchange for one's influence against what is true, right, or just. So any benefit given or accepted to influence a decision is a bribe. And in the Bible, we realize that it's an offense against God the weak, the innocent, and the community. And we also said that extortion is taking money from someone by violence, threats, or misuse of authority. So this is what is happening in our society. But the church is situated in the society. We come to church, and then from Monday, we are part of the society. So what has gone amiss? We are discussing under the broad topic, living a life of integrity as a Christian, we now want to zero in into the church. So I'll be discussing with you integrity crisis in the church. Integrity crisis in the church. The way we do church. That's why I sang the song, Lord, to be like Jesus. All we want is to be like him, not just to warm the pews. Not just to come and pay tithes. Not just to come and partake of the communion. After that, we want to be like Jesus. W.W. W. Wisby, a prolific writer and author, the one who wrote Integrity Crisis, has said that a blemished church struggles with accountability, morality, and the lifestyle of its leaders and the laity. A blemished church. Any church that is not right, any church that doesn't meet the standard of Christ, struggles, accountability, morality, and a lifestyle of its leaders and laity. Then, I want to give you some quotes before we move on. Then Abraham Lincoln has said, I am not bound to win but I'm bound to be true. I am not bound to succeed, but I'm bound to live up to what light I have. So it's not about the success. It's not about the image out there. It's not about the status. It's about living right. And it's about remaining true to our core. Then Charles Pagan also writes, this is another, another challenging one. Do right if heaven itself should grieve. If the sky should not be propped except by a lie, let them fall. 
Come what may, you never must in any degree or in any shape depart from the honest, the true, the right, the Christ like. That which God commands, that which alone God will approve. So for Charles Pagian, we ought to do what is right. Even if heaven that told us to live right, we grieve. We should do what is right. If the whole sky will fall, except the support should be made of lies, where we are, where we stand, we should let the sky fall. We know this dome is supported by columns and beams. And what Charles Pagan is saying that if I, Kumilabi, if Agbatoka Joe Lindsay, where you stand is this column, and you are supposed to be a liar, a corrupt person, so that this dome will stand. Charles Pagan said, because you are a Christian, let your end cave in. Can we stand to these things? Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. We have in defined integrity as being whole. Wholeness, perfection, soundness, simplicity, completeness, and sincerity. Mathematically, we, we say integers are whole numbers. And mixed fractions are whole numbers with some attachments. There should be no attachment to your wholeness. There should be nothing like one and a half. Integrity is being whole, an integer. And in engineering, we say structural integrity is something that is sound and fit for purpose. So as Christians, we are called from corrupt society. We were sanctified, justified, and regenerated and sent back to show forth the light, the salt that we have encountered. So if you go there, and the darkness comprehend our light, then we are not fit for purpose. Then we are not sound. Then they can tell us, but let me tell you, we are not attending church for attending sake. We've been saved. Whether there is church or no church, we are Christians. So if we are not sound and fit for purpose as Christians, then we are zooming in into integrity crisis. Crisis is a time of intense difficulty or danger in which a solution is needed. I'm attempting to define crisis. It's a time of intense difficulty or danger in which a solution is needed. And quickly before things deteriorate beyond despair. Is Ghana in crisis or not? We are. But where are the Christians? Where is the salt and the light of the land? Crisis is a time of intense difficulty or danger in which solution is needed quickly before things deteriorate. This nation is heading towards an entropy. Very soon, things will be in disarray. But we call ourselves as Christians. We are in the system. Yet, the center doesn't hold. God is counting on us. Hallelujah. We are in a time where the unlooking world do not seem to uphold the credibility of the church. Because they think the church lacks integrity. Because when they see us in church, and then what we do outside, they don't believe what we profess to have believed or seen. More especially when our numbers do not translate 
into the righteousness in the land. It's a problem. It's a problem. The pulpit must change. We are in a nation in which on Sundays we experience heavy traffic as if it's a normal weekday. From 11 a.m., you just drive around. Tatakwasi to Malam, traffic. Malam to Kaswa, traffic. Where are they going? They are going to church. But on Monday, things are normal. The nation is in crisis. It is in crisis because the saltiness of the church is not being felt. And the light that the church is supposed to show is becoming darkened. We all aspire to be like Jesus. But you and I agree that we are burdened that something ought to be done. We'll be looking at things like honesty, dishonesty, hypocrisy, and schemes that people indulge in. It is important to be aware of the ills in the system. So that any appearance of such, you send them. So I'm here to highlight some ills in the church. Today we are in. If you're able to wash our dirty clothing here, we can boldly dry them outside. We want to peg ourselves of the east. That is affecting the whole door. Beloved, integrity is a priority in every Christian's life. You need integrity because Warren Buffett has said that when you meet any person, look for three things. Intelligence, energy, and integrity. If they don't have the last one, don't even bother with the first two. That's why people can look into the face of a Christian and tell the person, because they see that we are intelligent. We have the ability and the skills, the knowledge, the technical know-how to solve the problems of the nation. We are very energetic, hard-working people. Our mothers wake up at dawn. They come home very late. We are hard-working guys. If anybody tells us we are lazy, no. I don't believe because I know we are hard-working guys. When we go outside, people do three, four jobs a day. We have the intelligence. We have the energy. But why are we in a mess? We lack integrity. Because you put the person there and you use the skills and energy to manipulate the system. So when Buffett says, if you meet a person who is intelligent, energetic, but lacks integrity, forget about the person. Because integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Honest and strong moral principles. This is the church that Jesus is building. Ephesians 5, 27 says, Ephesians 5, 27. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spots or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy without blemish. This would be the skill. This will be the litmus test. When on that day, the king of glory, the bridegroom sits in glory, and we appear before him as members of the church, this is the litmus test. He wants to see us in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, no defects. Without any blemish, something that would be admirable, good to present, appealing. We have some spots in our lives. 
Are there some bad spots in our lives? Do we live above reproach? Or people doubt us? May the good Lord have mercy on us. As Christians, we must be upright and whole. We must work towards meeting God's standard. Because for God, he will never lower his standard. If you read Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14, the Bible says that when there is sin in the land and God is about to destroy the land, even if Noah and Job were there, they could be saved only by their righteousness. That was the only criteria. They could be saved only by their righteousness. If God was to destroy the world because there was sin on the land, and even Noah and Job were there. Only their righteousness. And Daniel, he mentioned three names. It means there was a man who lived in a land of ooze. He was blameless. That was Job. And Noah at the time, the whole nation was in a mess. But he found favor with the Lord. And it was also said about Daniel that his people schemed, but they could find no corruption or negligence in his life. This will be the standard when we get there. So what is happening? In the church, we see scheming as a mechanism against integrity. Scheming. If we read Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says that, see, this only I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. So for God, he created us in his image, very perfect. But human beings don't want to be upright. Bible says they've sought out many schemes. As you try to tighten here, they're losing here. The very person who is sitting in church to enact the laws, even as he's being passed, he's thinking about the way and means to outwit the system. That is our lot. That's why we are in a mess. Schemes means making clever, secret plans, often to deceive others. Given to or involved in making secret and underhand plans. So as you sit here or as you listen to me, what clever plans are you hatching to outwit somebody in your business? In your marriage, in a church, at your workplace. What are you doing in an attempt to deceive people so that you can benefit from the system? That's why in Ghana, everybody ought to start his or her building for a red paint to be used to write on a stop work before the person gets the permit. May the good Lord have mercy on us. Because if the system is efficient, somebody will not get what he or she wants. So they will definitely frustrate the system. Not too long ago, we were told Lands Commission, they are automating the system. I put in my document. The following week, I had a test message. I went to pay, up to now, I can't track it. It started for one month. I know what I'm talking about. Why is it so? Are there pagans working there? Don't we have Christians there? Where is the lights and lands commission? And where is the salt? at the passport office. 
Even yesterday, I had an issue to solve for somebody. May the good Lord have mercy on us. Scheming means altering standards. For parochial interest, altering standards. This sin must be here. But so long as it is here, I will not benefit. So I have to bring it here. I'm in charge. I have the power to turn things around. Because I have power to turn things around, I will make sure that the standard is not met. So that I will benefit. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 1 warns. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. You go to Mokola to buy Gary Olonka. And half of it, newspapers. Half of it. The hand I had been hit inside, and some cement paper had been put inside. This word, this scripture, will face somebody one day. God, the Lord that we serve hates false balance. I would say it's a false balance, it's an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Am I speaking to Christians? Then may the Lord arise in our midst and encourage us to do what is right. According to Ye Pearson, a theologian said, he has said that men have sought out or invented many new ways in which to walk, forsaking the good old way in which God originally planned for them. So we have the standards here. We read. We pray. But we are careful to live by those that will bring us benefits. But those that will affect our lives, I see we don't see them in the Bible. So we try to put our own interpretation to the scripture. That's why somebody can just ask, if I'm going to pay my tithe and my mother is sick, what do I do? If I've lost my job and all there is in the community is to stake loto, is a sin. God will never lower his standard. If you ask me such questions, I will answer. Because we all read the Bible. So, as you are coming to ask me, it means you want to help, you want to use me to spin around it. And when the Bible was being written, you and I were not there. On the face of the pink sheet. That's what I'm reading. May the good Lord have mercy on us all. Hallelujah. So the Christian, in an attempt to scheme, to lower the standard, becomes a hypocrite, a dishonest person, and a person of duplicity. Come with me to Genesis chapter 27, paint a gloomy picture of a Christian, a supposed godly family, headed by Mr. Isaac, assisted by assistant pastor, Mrs. Rebecca Isaac, with her first son, the presiding elder, elder Esau Isaac, and the deacon, deacon Jacob Isaac, because the father is Isaac. And in this story, we observe that the father who is Isaac was very old. And he knew that God has said the older one will serve the younger one, and the older one was Esau. And he was supposed to serve the younger one, Jacob. The family knew, at least between the father and the mother. So now, Isaac calls Esau behind closed doors. And they scheme. They hatch a plot. So that what Rebecca knew should happen will not happen. So when they were there, Isaac told the son, go get me my favorite meat so that I'll bless you. 
So we see parents who want to be facilitated before they do what is right. The father at his old age is supposed to bless. Because freely he had received. And he had to bless. But this man wants to be facilitated. In our nation, people in authority always want to take something before they do what they are supposed to do. A secretary is being paid to do secretarial work. Pass files around. Pass files around. But if you don't put weight on it, the wind from the sea, we take it from Insana straight to Sunyane. May the good Lord have mercy on us. So Isaac wanted to be facilitated before he blessed. Beloved, in our church, do people give us things before we give them appointments? And colleague apostles, when you sit in council and are taking decisions, do you look at people who have, in a way, facilitated you? Do you pull the lists of the Christmas gifts before you take decisions? If it is so, then you are scheming. So Isaac and Esau plan evil. Then Rebecca will not sit alone. She will not sit unconcerned. So she passes by, chance on an information. And women, they are smarter than men. As far as home management is concerned, oh, my brother, you will put your socks there unless your wife tells you where the socks is you can't find. So for that, we applaud you. So if you want to scheme in the home without consulting your wife, now lie. So unfortunately, Rebecca chanced on the information and he hatched a scheme. They plotted something to deceive a husband and a father. Your family setting. Are you one? Is there cohesion in the house? Or there is a split? Confusion. If the father speaks, does the mother support? When the parents are not there, have we led a legacy for them to be one? Share whatever they have, or there is a problem in the house. Now, Jacob goes to prepare and then plan as the mother advised. He used the food, the clothing, and some craftiness to take advantage of the blind old man who wants meat before blessing. So now the young man comes. And this is the troubling aspect. Verse 18 to 24. So he went into his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly? My son, he said, because the Lord, your God, granted me success. Lying and swearing. There are some people, even if they are holding that thing, they'll ask you who told you. Well, that thing is in their hands. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy. Like his brother Esau said. So he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? So 
So we see the old man struggling. But he has been facilitated already. Because part two, we said, bright blinds the eyes of the wise. And perverts justice. So once the aroma was in the room, and there was meat to eat, well then I worry. Now I will say well then I will slap. So now he feels there's something amiss in the room. Draw closer. Ah, oh, my son, are you really a son? He said yes. The voice. Is Jacob. But the son, the hands, are the hands of Esau. As Christians, who are you? What is your real name? What is your real name? Are your hands correlating with your voice? Can you be trusted? In all things, when a friend shares a secret with you, do you really keep it as confidential? When you say, I'll pray with you, do you really pray? The voice must correlate the hands. Otherwise, we don't meet the standard. So, as a struggles to bless, but for the blessing, he had to. But having received the blessing, there was animosity between the brothers to the extent that Esau vowed to kill the brother. And Rebecca wanted blessing, had to plan with the son to leave the house. Complete separation. Beloved in Christ, what schemes I hatching in the church? For some people, if they target and aim this position, they will do all that is within their power to get there. When you visit leaders, what is the subject of discussion? Do you go there to pretend so that you can win favor as opposed to painting some people black your sin will one day find you out. For your name, one day God will ask you, what is your name? What is your real name? You are a Christian. You are not a hypocrite. You've been called from darkness into his marvelous light so that you'll be sent back to show forth what he has done for you. We should live as people who have been born again, fully regenerated, Bible says, if someone is in Christ, he has become a new creation. Not rehabilitated, not repented, not refurbished. A new creation. The old has passed. Behold, all, everything has become new. The things I used to do, I do them no more. The lies I used to tell, I tell them no more. It was a glad day since I was born. Now we don't sing these songs. We don't sing these songs. So it's like we have brought what is outside, inside. We used to malign people. We are maligning people here. We used to lie to deceive so that we can get some promotion. We are doing the same here. May God have mercy on the church. Scheming results in more obsession, delusion, frustration, and dissatisfaction. If you want to scheme, you are always planning to get more. Always want to get more. You never get satisfied. Scheming is a sign of covetousness. So covetousness is the strong desire to have that which belongs to others. Not all of you can become presiding at a time. In Ghana, we have 1,500 pastors. Globally, we are almost 3,000. But within any five years, we have but one chairman. So if God has not given it to you and you scheme, you become a covetous person. 
And for God, it is sin. An abomination. So covetousness is considered to be a very strong and grievous offense in Scripture. As stated in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. Jesus also listed covetousness or greed along with many of the sins from within. You see, sometimes, including adultery, theft, murder, sometimes we think about fornication as sin, adultery as sin. We, we, we scarcely suspend people for fighting. We scarcely suspend people for lying and maligning people. But if you read the scriptures very well, you see that there is no categorization of sin. Sin is sin, not meeting the standard. So Paul reminded Ephesians that greed or covetousness is equated with immorality and impurity. So the person who is covetous, the person who is scheming, is as sinful as the person who is chasing somebody's wife. The same. So that this might be put away. A covetous or greedy person is an idolater. Somebody who converts is like a fetish priest. There are issues in the Bible. So you can't say that this man is just chanting and pouring libation, so the person is condemned to death. If you're a Christian, you're a scheme. The Bible says you are coveting. And if you are coveting things that do not belong to you, you're an idol worshiper. And God will judge such people. The more we scheme, makes us dishonest people. Warren Buffett has said again, honesty is very expensive gift. Don't expect it from cheap people. Honesty is a very expensive gift, so that, therefore, don't expect it from cheap people. So if you meet people who are not truthful, you ask the person first question, the answer will come. Press the button again, then it's shifting. Go the third time, then it's lying. You can't try the person. It's a cheap person. Albert Einstein also said, whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted with important matters. To be dishonest is to know the truth but deny it. You know this is what is right. You know this is what you are supposed to do. But you boldly disown that. Then you are a dishonest person. And that leads to hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the false appearance of virtue or goodness. Pretending to be what you are not. It's shown in our prayers. It's shown in the way we preach. And it's shown in the way we conduct business in the church. Especially with respect to religious and moral beliefs. If you read Hosea chapter 4, verse 7 to 9, there's something they say that the more people they wear, the more they sin. Can you imagine? The more people they wear, the more they sin. And that's what I call religious hypocrisy. Because they exchange their glorious God for something disgraceful. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. The Apostle states in 2 Timothy that some evil people do window dressing of faith by rejecting the actual power of the Holy Spirit. They put on church as a dress. And on Sunday, when they come to church, they are godly. After Sunday, when they go to work, they remove church and put on worldly. So they have a form of godliness. By the power therein, they deny. Titus chapter 1 verse 16 says, and I read, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. Straight. We're talking about integrity crisis in the church. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Period. So if somebody professes to be a Christian and all he knows is to come and sing, dancing around the throne of glory, and then he goes there and he's maligning, 
He goes there and he's scheming. He goes there and he's taking bribes. He goes out there and he's chasing people's wives. He goes out there and he's doing all the things that the people are doing. Bible says that he's not fit. So the integrity fit for purpose has come here again. He wants to lower the standard. These people decide portions of the scripture they can live with. Those that they are not comfortable with, they contest. And want to put some interpretation to it. And the Bible says, avoid such people. People who live double standards. There is nothing like that. In Christianity, if you want to drink, drink deep. No lukewarmness. Let the people know that right from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, you are a Christian, a Christian, and a Christian. If you live your life that way, the challenges will come. But God will be on your side. Because you are said of Paul and Sarah, the people who turn the world upside down has been here also. So why are we in the system and things are normal? Oh no. Why are you in the system and things are normal? Beloved, if we live for Christ and we let the light shine, the Lord will be on our side. And sooner or later they will ask whether you are the real person. And it is you alone who tell them, yes, I am. The person you disregarded is the same person the Lord has brought this far. Let's live for Christ. Observing religious hypocrisy, Madma Gandhi has said this. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Let me take it again. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Beloved, the nation needs us. By virtue of the good foundation that our forebears had laid for the church and the goodwill, they like the church. By looking into the future, would that glory still be maintained? It behoves you and I. So for Magna Gandhi, he has read about Christ. He knows what Christ stands for. And he knows how Christians, people prefer to be Christian or to live their life. But when he just opposes the teachings and the doings, they don't match. So it's like, he's a bit frustrated. We have Christians in the land. The people have heard about our teachings, but when they look at us, they marvel. They wonder whether we believe in what we preach. Our hands must correlate our voice. Wisby continues to say, hypocrisy is lying to other people about your faith. There are many ways we do this. Preaching what we don't practice. We preach love, but we live in hatred. We preach simplicity, but we live affluent life. We preach fellowship, but there is disunity. We pray about things we don't even believe. And we pretend to be what we are not. Beloved, who are we deceiving? We're out there. And God, the favor, the, the favor of God or the grace of God found us. And he brought us closer. Prepared us. And wants to release us back into the system. Now Jesus is up there. But when we come to Ghana, at least he wants to count on you. Can he count on you as a Christian? It's your light. Becoming darkened, and where is your saltiness? Beloved, as I conclude, we must watch what we say as Christians and live by them. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10 says, For Ezra has set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and the rules 
in Israel. For me, if we're able to do this, Agbena, we come to church, we say, don't take bribe. I'll go to work, I won't take bribe, and I'll boot that away. It will not be you alone. Somebody will stand, another will stand, another will stand. So it will be like the Christians are being sacked from their workplaces. Why? Because they don't want to take bribe. Because Bible says so. So we should start practicing what we preach. And as we live by them, we'll be able to teach others. We'll speak less, but our message will go very far. Because they'll look at us and they'll see that we are people who are trustworthy. We must watch our doctrine and our life closely. Because the outside world is watching. As I conclude, as Christians, what is your goal? Why are you here? God did not call us just to bless us. The blessing I call bush allowance. It's like going to farm to harvest your corn and having set a trap and you get some antelope. You don't bring the antelope home rejoicing that I've been to farm. That one is bush allowance. The aim is to go and harvest your corn. He called us from the world and he's sending us to heaven. When we get there, his standard is holiness. His standard is a church that is without spots or wrinkle. In this world, if you want to live right, we will suffer. But God will surely be on our side. According to Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 9, people with integrity walk safely. But those who follow crooked paths will be exposed. We must endeavor to live life devoid of hypocrisy, dishonesty. People should not struggle to know who we are. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse. If you read Romans chapter 1, the sins that we are seeing today, worse ones are coming. Because Romans 1 tells us, people invent sin. So what we are seeing today, if Jesus should tarry, we see worse sins. If you are saying that people now, parents are raping their daughters, homosexual, worse things are going to come. If Jesus should tarry. So evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And concluding is, but as for you, continuing in what you have learned and what have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned them. As Christians, let's continue to be what God wants us to be. Soon and very soon, the trumpet will sound. And when the roll is called up yonder, God is going to count the people who are able to live their lives as men and women of integrity. May the good Lord continue to have mercy on this church. Amen. Subscribe to our social media handles for life-transforming messages.